Hey, well, listen, firstly, can I say uh, thank you so much for coming here. Who wouldn't want to be here? One of the most stunning places on earth uh, here up here in Queenstown. Uh, and it's important to be here because we want to talk a little bit about how we can boost tourism, uh, which we desperately want to grow so that we can actually help rebuild this economy that is in some challenges and some trouble at the moment. Before I begin, can I just quickly acknowledge uh, Joseph Mooney, who is our tourism spokesperson, but also has the great privilege of being the MP for this fantastic region uh, and is a great advocate for us. So thank you, Joseph. And can I also acknowledge all the Skyline team who are so generously hosting us here at their place today and done such an exceptional job as you would have seen with the gondola, uh, which is a, a massive project and a massive commitment and investment in this region because they have faith in it. Uh, this election is all about the economy and on October 14th, New Zealanders are going to choose who they think will do a better job of rebuilding the economy to end the cost of living crisis and to get our country back on track. And I do want New Zealanders to understand that thanks to Labour's economic mismanagement, New Zealand is the only country in the Asia Pacific region in economic recession, the only one. And that means that our economy is shrinking and it's declining and that's frankly bad news for every single New Zealander. And it means that inflation and interest rates are staying higher for longer and the cost of living crisis is even worse. And with recession comes the risk of rising unemployment. So it really didn't have to be this way, but thanks to Labour's economic mismanagement, it is. And National, like others before, is going to have to clean up a financial mess in government. Now to get this economy out of recession, we actually have to grow it. And that means that we have to hustle and we have to look to grow every single sector we have in the economy. Tourism, of course, is one of New Zealand's biggest export earners. And so I'm pleased to be here today to share our plan on how we can give a boost to tourism and to actually get it moving forward. As someone who's worked in the sector for a long time, I have to tell you that tourism people are simply the best. They are tough, they are resilient, they're practical, they're can-do people. And let's be clear, tourism and hospitality has been hammered in recent years during the pandemic and under this government. And so it's good to see tourism coming back, but it still has not fully recovered, uh, being 1.4 million visitors still short of the highs that it had before the pandemic and operators are really dealing and wrestling with the impacts of inflation and also high interest rates. So there's a lot that we need to do to grow tourism in the coming years, but National will give tourism a short-term boost through, I think, six very practical actions. The first is, we have seen how economically transformative the great walks have been to local towns across the country. And so we will create a new 80-kilometre great walk at Waiatoa, Molesworth and Canterbury to attract more visitors to this very special part of New Zealand. Secondly, following on from yesterday's announcement of a nationwide network of 10,000 electric vehicle chargers, National will contribute $3 million to boost e-bike charging infrastructure on the New Zealand cycle trails to make it even more accessible for people of all ages and fitness levels to enjoy. And these funds will support up uh, the installation of up to 120 solar-powered e-bike charging stations. Thirdly, National will require the Department of Conservation to reach concession decisions within one year and concessions must be issued for a minimum of five years with a right of renewal to provide certainty for tourism operators to invest in unique experiences in the dock estate. Fourthly, National will ensure tourism and hospitality businesses can get access to the staff that they need to deliver the visitors the world-class experiences and customer service that New Zealand has become so famous for. And so we will firstly lift the upper age uh, to apply for a working holiday visa in New Zealand from 30 to 35 for all eligible countries. And we will allow them to apply for a second or a third holiday visa if they work in areas of shortages like tourism. We also will introduce a priority processing service to allow migrants and businesses to fast track visa applications. And we will also scrap the median wage requirement and let businesses and sectors like tourism attract the staff they need at rates that reflect their skills and experience. How many more workers do you expect that will bring into the country? Well, it will depend. I mean, it will depend on how many more we can attract. At the moment, it's important because we are competing for those uh, holiday visa uh, makers with Australia, with Canada, with other countries, and we want to make it as an attractive proposition as possible. Being able to renew for two, for a second time or a third time is also really helpful as well. So we want to encourage that, and we want to be able to reach out and actually uh, make, make New Zealand attractive again as it once was. Are we talking thousands or tens of thousands of new workers? I think it will be thousands, uh, hopefully, hopefully tens of thousands, but it really will be determined on actually how good a job and how competitive our offering is and how good we can attract those people here. And scrapping that median wage, aren't you allowing operators to simply pay peanuts? No, no, not at all. The same rules apply, but what's actually happening is that 
that's a barrier for actually uh, tourism businesses being able to actually hire staff and actually attract good staff. And so what we need to be able to do is pay and, and make sure that you know this is a sector that needs to pay for the skills and experience that it's got. It needs to pay good wages, obviously. You've got to keep building good businesses that drive wages up. But putting a false barrier in that, which is actually means that actually no migrant workers are employed, it has a huge bunch of implications for tourism operators. It's one thing bringing workers into a place like Queenstown, but there's, we've got workers here who, yes. are, who, are, li who are living in cars. And yes, I know. Yep. So what, can you just tell, yep. tell so, a little bit more about national policy to help with housing? Yeah, so it's a major issue, particularly here in Queenstown, as you well know. Look, there's, there's four things I think that need to happen. I mean, the first thing is that we need to get the council actually consenting land, and we're gonna ask every council in the country to consent 30 years of housing growth tomorrow. And that means that it's very clear about where development is gonna take place, and actually the land is available. But at the moment, the council's not helping the issue by not actually consenting land to actually add and build houses into Queenstown to support those workers. So that's job one. Job two is that we have to get the private rental market functioning properly because landlords are not wanting to rent their houses out to tenants at the moment because the incentives aren't there. And as a result, that's why we're unwinding the bright line test and also interest deductibility. Uh, and importantly, you know, we're linked to that. We also need to make sure that we are opening up build to rent programs as well, which exist uh, in other parts of the world. I know there's some good appetite for that here in Queenstown. There's some good uh, test of a, of a case certainly happening in Auckland that was announced in the last two weeks as well. And then we need to be able to get capital to really good community housing providers. And you with Julie here have one of the best um, you know, housing trusts in the country. Frankly, that's very progressive, very onto it. Uh, and we need to be able to get them access to capital ultimately so that they can get on and actually build houses as well. And the final bit I'd say to you is actually, it's about, we, we have managed infrastructure abysmally in New Zealand over many, many decades. And we now need to look at a different way of doing that. And that is partly our 30 year pipeline from the infrastructure of New Zealand, our 10 year city and regional deals. We sit down with a region like this and say, what is the critical infrastructure? It might be hospitals, it might be roads, it might be you know, housing, it might be climate adaptation. It'll vary by sub regions of New Zealand. And actually, let's lock and load those projects so that as political people change and central government or local government, actually, pe projects aren't turned off and on. They're actually going to carry on as a result. Migrant um, exploitation is already a major problem. I mean, doesn't this just open up the risk even more? No, it doesn't have to be. If Immigration New Zealand was doing its job, uh, and you know, if you think about the, the accredited work program, where only two percent of people have been audited, you know, that where, that is that, that is a separate issue where we want to maintain a really high standards. We do not want to see migrant exploitation in New Zealand. The images that we've all seen over the last six weeks in this country are things that we see in other places, but we would never expect to see. So, would here you in give Zealand. Immigration New Zealand more resources and more money? Then, oh, I expect if you're Immigration about... New Zealand to actually do what they're supposed to do, which is to audit those employers and to make sure that they are good employers. Thanks for checking out our YouTube channel to stay up to date with all the latest news from the New Zealand Herald. Click the subscribe button below or check out one of the videos here and head over to nzherald.co.nz for more details on these stories and more.